You'll notice that my video resolution from screen sharing is not <laughs> as crisp as I would like it. Uh, that's just something that happened with the recording, so just bear with me. Um, in a perfect world, it would be much higher resolution. So, without further ado, let's get into it. The very first step is opening your file. You can make it 17 by 11, 36 by 24, or whatever size your project calls for. The higher the PPI pixels per inch, the crisper your design will be in the end. Although, keep in mind, more PPI translates to larger files, which eats up your space on your computer. 150 PPI is usually a safe bet. Once you have your file open, turn on grid and snapping. Grid makes it so you can draw to scale. Snapping makes it easier to be accurate with many things you rotate, such as the ruler or just rotating an object on your page. I like to place my snapping at 30 degrees, but you could also do 45 or 90. I'm making my own scale on this, so I'm setting the grid spacing to 100 pixels. You can play around with it, but this is going to make it so that each square will represent 4 feet. The next thing to consider are the three different brush types, pixel, live, and vector. Pixel brushes are great for achieving a softer, hand-drawn, good old-fashioned pencil-on-paper look. There are tons of cool charcoal brushes that can make a nice translucent fill, such as the brush Color Fill, which is a good one for layering color gradually. The next type are live brushes. These are oil or watercolor. They're cool because they react in a way that that wet media would off-screen. They can lose resolution and can be a little unreliable for something that needs to be more exact, like line work for a scale. Finally, there are vectors. Vectors are not pixelated. They are special in their ability to maintain clarity of image regardless of how blown up it becomes. This is the type of brush you always want to use for line work. It is easy to follow hierarchy of line weights by changing the brush size or color. Using shades of gray is a good way to make your image more readable, since it directs focus to the darkest, most important features you have drawn. The color palette design on the left is covered in a really great video by Kyle T. Webster, which is in the drive. I highly recommend watching this and making palettes that are cohesive and have colors which all work together. So I'm going to make that, as well as the two circles I just created, go away using the hide function. There's two ways I can do this. I can highlight their icons and select the eyeball one by one which works fine if you aren't doing more than three or so. But it is much easier if you're doing more to instead click the ellipses and pull up a larger menu. In the second section from the top, find the select multiple option. Now I can select as many in one go as I want. Saving time in small ways like this really adds up, so it's good to learn these habits early on. Now I have both selected and I'm going to group them together by hitting the file icon below the eyeball. When I hit the eyeball, the action applies to the whole group, and I don't have to do them individually. Grouping in this way is a very important organizational device. It keeps layers together and organized and makes it easy to make design decisions. Like this, I can lay down an overlap of three colors and add a fourth overlapping one. I can try both, see what works best, and then delete the one that's not working. Using vector brushes, the ruler, which is located in the bottom left, having snapping function on at 30 degrees, and a grid at whatever pixel makes sense for your image, make creating scales and drawing to them very easy, much like drawing with a May line on grid paper. Notice how there is a star next to these brushes? These are my commonly used ones. I can add more by going back to the All category and selecting the star next to the brush. So I take the round vector brush and begin to make my scale. I'm making a 100 by 50 foot lot, so I will make a scale that has 4 feet per square. You can also import an image from Vectorworks or CAD by saving a high quality JPEG to your iPad camera roll and clicking the icon that looks like a photo. It takes time and finagling but you can match your grid to the bar scale from an imported image. I only recently started doing that. There's probably a faster way. Then I'll add some labels with the pencil. 
After adding my hardscape layers, I'll place some trees. A way I like to draw trees to scale is by making a frame. I'm going to lay the ruler down on the bar scale and draw out the desired canopy in a single line. I'll hit the ellipses on the left side and duplicate the layer by selecting the button under Select Multiple, which we used earlier. Now we are going to rotate one of the lines 90 degrees to make this into a plus sign. To do this, click the compass icon on the right side below the smudge tool, which is a finger icon. This tool will allow you to move objects around. This is where having things on their own layer comes in handy. Layers are the key to making changes using the move tool. Layers result in having much more flexibility with design changes. So to rotate that line 90 degrees, grab the handle on the side of the blue rectangle that appears when the compass and a layer are selected. In this case, it's the line layer. Rotate it 90 degrees. Since you have rotation snapping on, this is a snap. Place them over top each other to make a plus sign, move them up and away, and now you'll have a frame, which will make drawing plant shapes to scale much easier. It can be resized by grabbing one of the white circles in the corner known as a grip. Grabbing the corner makes it scale up or down without warping. So I've gone ahead and created some loose, stylized plant icons. I can duplicate these hand-drawn shapes and place them around at different sizes by comparing them to either my grid or bar scale. The first thing to do after importing is to convert our image to a pixel layer, which is done by highlighting the imported image layer and selecting the ellipses. Look towards the bottom of the list and you'll see the option to convert to a pixel layer. Select this and you are able to use the lasso on images. You can loop it with the lasso tool, which in this case is like exact doing an image for collage. You can cut out specific areas by hitting erase after highlighting and closing the lasso. Some images like this one can be cut out even faster using the magic wand tool, which is in the same category as lasso. Press and hold the icon under compass to get options for the selection tool. Select the magic wand to quickly cut out areas with high contrast, such as the contrast between this Quercus lobata and the sky behind. If I want to remove the sky, I hit erase. If I want to remove the tree for some reason, I will hit the ellipses now shown towards the bottom of the screen and choose the invert selection icon. When I hit delete, the tree is gone. Another cool thing I can do is draw a circle using the lasso tool and grab the texture of the canopy. It's a bit round on the bottom side, so I can make my eraser small and chew it up a bit to match the more organic texture of the canopy edge. If I lower the opacity to 50 or 60% while placing, it passes as a pretty nice tree viewed from above. So that's a slice of fresco and how it can be used in a landscape design context. There's so much more to it, but the main takeaways are Keep things on separate layers so you can change your design as much as you like without wasting time. Keep your layers organized in folders. Use duplicates to save time. And mix the color palette first so you don't wind up with an uncanny valley effect with color. Thanks for watching. <laughs> and um, yeah, I hope this helped you guys. This is kind of the stuff I use. And it's I've just been you know figuring out along the way. If you find anything else cool, let me know. Um, we'll, we'd love to hear it.